F5. All right. So my task uh, was to talk about analysis and, and uh, uh, tools and portals. Uh, so we're going to be shifting gears a little bit uh, because what I want to talk about um, is given the sequences in, in a central place, variants recalled, aggregated, metadata, fi uh, phenotype data harmonized, what tools are needed to make the data useful for the community. So I know conversation tends to come back what's possible given the uh, data restrictions, but I think it's important to explore uh, what's possible in an ideal world, how we could make the data, so who, are the, who is our user base, what analysis we can do, and how uh, to make this most effectively. So the first slide here is just a, an incomplete laundry list of the type of analysis we can do given the variants. Uh, Steve already uh, covered some of these. We can provide phased haplotypes, uh, <laughs> aggregate allele frequencies across populations and across the whole uh, cohort, calculate variant burdens in various ways. Uh, we can provide functional annotations at coding uh, and uh, non-coding uh, parts of the genome. Lots of function analysis, including information from disease databases. We can redo GWAS analysis in various ways and go to higher order analysis, system biology uh, approaches to network pathway analysis and so on. Some of these analysis are well-defined. Some are pretty open-ended. Some are easy. Uh, some are very hard algorithmically, and accordingly, some tools are available for these. In some cases, the tools are still emerging. Some require a lot of computation. Some are very easy to do uh, and uh, don't require a huge computational burden. In, terms, in order to prioritize which of these analyses are important to us, the most important uh, is who are we trying to serve with all these analyses and the tools that we are developing because the analysis that were described in the previous slides clearly mean different things to different people and answer, uh, and, and uh, people are interested in very different aspects of the data. Mm -hmm. So uh, David uh, Altshuler made the point uh, abundantly that uh, statisticians and tool developer, developers are already very well served, people like me. We wouldn't have this project for people like us. Medical consortium uh, project analysts and drug developers uh, uh, will benefit, but they already are fairly empowered. So really the, the target audience, in my opinion, uh, again, starting downstream from the variants, is really biologists in small laboratories, students, postdocs, um, and clinicians who don't necessarily uh, have the expertise and the resources for uh, taking advantage of the data. So in this vein, uh, the question is how to make our analysis accessible. First thing, I think the key aspect is things have to be easy. Tools would have to be easy to install, easy to use. They have to be intuitive, preferably fast. And if they're fast, they can be interactive. And I sort of highlighted web-based, which is not the only mode to accomplish this, but it's a very good way to accomplish this and one that's for which modern technologies exist. HTML5 uh, is making a real impact on being able to access even large amount of data and uh, uh, locally render images with new web-based technologies. Uh, this is only one side, the other side uh, is even if, even if these tools are very easy and easy to install, there are some other impediments from small users to use the data. Some of the larger analyses require huge computational and storage resources, but users will have access to basically laptops, resources on this scale. Some of these, uh, uh, using these tools and running these tools require groups of analysts with a highly, who are highly skilled in, in bioinformatics and computation. Uh, what we want is people who are, whose expertise lie in other areas, in experimental biology, to be able to use the same tools. So with this in mind, what are the ways we can and hopefully will in the future be able to provide uh, the, the, the data and the analysis to the community? Well, raw data download is sort of the baseline. 
Everybody understands that's been the mode of operation. Uh, easiest to accomplish, um, hardest to go afterwards because now you have to store and compute the data, install the tools, all the stuff I talked about. Query portals, viewers, data slicers, Steve covered that in great detail. I think that's a, that's, that's, that, that really is making an impact now. For example, the 1,000 genome data is now available through these data slicers from EBI and uh, NCBI as well. I think that's a very good way to, uh, to get the data to the users. Um, static variant annotations, pre-computing your resources. Again, Steve talked about that. That's also very important. Uh, but it's limited because many of the analysis will require more dynamic content. And I'm gonna to come to that. So this really, this fourth is I think for us to, for, for the way forward, where you have central data, for example, all the sequences from the medical projects. Uh, you bring tools next to them uh, users can upload their own data, analyze them in conjunction with the central data set, and you provide an environment in which the tools can be run. I think this is ideal. This is, this is in my opinion, where things are going. So parsing out what are those areas where static analysis makes sense, and there are a number of these. Uh, clearly, variants, variant analytic frequencies, sample genotypes, uh, fairly simple data types that are easy to uh, compute and they, they, they general. Uh, phase haplotypes, a so very well defined uh, data type again. Basic per variant annotations, and I'm going to come back to this. Um, metadata, phenotype information, uh, again, things that are, uh, are static content. In order to make these available, you need better query tools. And again, Steve covered this, I think, uh, um, uh, very thoughtfully. Uh, there's a great need for being able to query and browse phenotypes, and there's very little available in that, uh, in that area. Uh, we also need sophisticated viewers. Uh, one example is just looking at the variants. So current viewers are basically either genome browsers or, seek or, or, or alignment viewers. But what's important about the variant is their structure and what they do to the genome. So here's an example. This is a sort of a mock-up. Um, where a deletion introduces, so the structure of the variant, it, that it's a deletion, it deletes some of the chromosome, and what it does to, the, to, the, to, it, to, to genes is it makes a fusion gene. So this level of, of, of visualization uh, and interaction, uh, in my opinion, is essential. Also, if we were to provide haplotypes, how to browse the haplotypes uh, and phenotypes as I talked about. So what tasks are more dynamic that it makes more sense to provide tools to analyze these dynamically and provide customized content? Uh, turns out that read mapping and variant calling for users' own data, and this is on ongoing. Uh, there are a number of projects funded by NHGRI. Uh, the Broad has one, Gonzalo and I running one of these, is actually aiming to make these tools available in such an environment, in an uh, integrated analysis environment for users. Imputation, so we've been talking about uh, the possibility of a central haplotype resource and associated computing infrastructure that allows imputation of uh, individual data into the central haplotype resource. Uh, customized functional annotations, these are not practicable to compute. You can't foresee any possible structural variation, genome rearrangement or deletion. Uh, the aggregate effect of phase variance, this is a slide from Danielle MacArthur. So we often see in, thousand genomes, in the 1,000 Genomes projects that uh, consecutive indel, uh, indels, uh, if considered in separation, they uh, introduce frame shifts, but they always observe an individual in phase, in which case the phase is restored, the, the frame is restored. So these are the kind of things, again, that you can't really pre-compute. You need dynamic uh, computations for these. Uh, turns out that this category of, uh, uh, has the highest tool development cost because um, you're not just making these tools available as command line tools, but there's more infrastructural um, development. Uh, do we need 
one tool or do we need multiple competing alternate tools? Uh, this is an example and the specifics are not particularly important, but these were comparisons from the Thousand Genomes Project somewhere along the way, maybe a year ago. Uh, these comparisons are, 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 are fairly common. If we look at the same exact data set, process them with a number of different tools, in this case we were calling them with some experimental uh, tools on chromosome 20, and then we compare these. And what's important about them is that, is that if we use the results in combination, say for example, take all the variants that are called by at least two different tools, the quality of the data set improves. So, th so, that's, so the point here is that there, is, there are inherent advantages to having alternate uh, tools available. Centralized or distributed development. Uh, the point, and I think a very important point was made yesterday, I think maybe Mike brought this up, that tool development is iterative. Once you get an answer, you want uh, to ask a new question. It's not possible to say, okay, we're specking out, this, are the, this is the information we want to uh, get at, and then two years down the line, the tool, the tool appears and, and that, that satisfies everybody. It's, it's, it is really a, a, an iterative, ongoing process which requires flexibility. So oft, uh, users are often better served by light, flexible tools for customized analysis than with large, uh, more monolithical systems. And this, uh, so for example, I'm very partial to skiing, and what you see here is all the available snow report uh, apps on iTunes. You know, I use some of them, some of them are great, some of them I, I really don't care for. But the point is all these are looking at the same data, uh, and the ones that provide, you know, go the extra mile, uh, allow people to uh, give you know, uh, like up-to-date reports. They tell me, you know, it's like, oh yeah, this is great. Uh, come out or oh, that's not where we're going. Those are the ones that survive. So providing it, providing tools in this way makes sort of a competitive, makes for a competitive environment uh, where uh, tools are driven by demand side economics as, uh, as we heard from uh, Lincoln yesterday. Who would develop the tools? Uh, uh, in our experience in uh, the Thousand Genomes Project, which is, in some ways, we can look at it as a very as a large uh, uh, tech development project, we see a balance of tools coming from larger groups at large genome centers, and uh, a, and a large also a large cottage industry of successful uh, tool developers. Uh, and what we find is that even fairly small informatics tools can produce very sophisticated software and high performance software and respond to nimbly to user needs. So last slide uh, before we get into the discussion. So if I look into my crystal ball, uh, I would say we need to focus on the cloud because that gives that's the right combination of things we need, not necessarily for uh, providing big central analyses, but for the biologist that doesn't have the resources, because it gives you all the components. I think we should build an open environment for tool deployment uh, to pull in the widest possible developer base and let tools compete with each other and, uh, and let uh, these tools follow demand. And this is not impossible. There is, that, that's where technology is going. Models uh, exist, for example, the iPhone um, apps that everybody is using. And with that, I'll open up for discussion. Yes. Excellent presentation. I, I really like the uh, analogy of the app, app uh, world. Uh, my question in that case is that where is the platform? Is there one platform or multiple platforms and who is developing those platforms, right? Because you say iPhone, I think iPhone is in this case a platform who will be the ge uh, genomic platform in this case, and is it one or multiple? I don't necessarily think that this would be iPhone applications where we analyze genomic data, although, you know, you never know. There might be some questions uh, where that's perfectly, perfectly sufficient. Uh, David. Well, no, I, just, I had a, a, a comment and a question, or two questions. One question is, 
yesterday Mark presented the analysis server with apps and there was this generally negative response and now I'm hearing positive ideas to apps. I just want to draw the line. This is this, it's the same, whether like in some sense for the apps to run, there has to be a platform and there has to be data they can access. So this is, you're, is it the same or a different idea you're proposing? Well, I think, I think so the idea that, that here is that uh, as long as we can put together a platform, I think what's key about this is that, is that you have freedom to put in applications. Any developer can go right. and, 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 and answer a, a question that may be of interest to the so users. Just, right, this is exactly what Mark said yesterday. It, and, it, and it's, I'm just saying there were other people, I actually think it's a great idea, yes. but there were other people who said it's intractable, it's impossible, we shouldn't try and do it. So No, I think, I think, I think the difference is that there's multiple ways to look at it. A, you can say, okay, we're going to build something that will answer these specific questions, then it's not. If we say, okay, we're just going to make a, make a, a platform available, uh, all the data that you would need to answer questions that may arise this year, or, or we already know, or some that arise next year, and uh, let so the apps have to so the thing yeah the apps have to be nimble that's yeah. the only no but also the apps have to have all the security and all the things and let, but the, so the other right. question I had for you is you discussed the you discussed a world in which the biologists and the clinicians want access to things like variants but that's probably like so they want answers to questions right for the most part. so right. do, do you you didn't really talk a lot about analysis of phenotypes you Correct. Talk mo so is, how yeah, but so, so, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I don't think to a clinician variants are horribly useful because they find, they say, okay, I see this, you know, they do some, you know, they, they send off for a, a clinical sequencing test, they find, oh, there is a variant in this gene, and they may, they may know that, okay, there's another variant in the same gene and that causes, you know, phenotype. How do I alter treatment? Uh, I completely agree with you. So that's where the app comes in. So that's like data integration apps, uh, looking at it useful ways that can provide a clinician with specific information. These applications can be certified. Uh, they can uh, they can be certified to satisfy various uh, requirements for, to be used in the clinic and so on. I think the reaction, David, just to I, kind of clarify a little bit that the distinction between Mark's presentation and Gabor's a little bit to me was this issue of vetting the applications that come in. And the idea here is that, the, if I, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but you presented this such that this would be for the average biologist, and there would still be an opportunity for people to develop, let's say, their own applications and download the data, move it locally, and actually do the compute. So That was if said I, yesterday also. Yes. <clears throat> but there was this thing about, well, what's the criteria for vetting an application? No, no, but, but he just didn't but, talk about it, but it would have to happen, because otherwise you have the same problems everyone raised. Right. But he I just didn't happen to talk about it. One word that was used, and I think, Mark, you mentioned, it was scalability. And so certain types of applications, discovering of certain types of structural variation, are very comp computationally expensive. And if a decision was made that this is you know, too much of an investment to, do, to have an app that would run on the central server, it would still want the option to be able to take that data and actually do the analysis locally as opposed to having things vetted because there's, you know, it's not scalable for... You know, no, no, for so first of all, yesterday it was always said that, of course, the so baseline, the data is always available for anyone who wants to do it. We're trying to enable people who aren't able to do it. But second of all, Gabor didn't talk about the fact, and no one asked, well, if you had that app and it was on the machine, but it would be computationally so expensive, it would, who's going to pay for the server, who's going to ensure the security? It's just the two discussions differed in the focus on what it would take to achieve it, but the idea is exactly the same. Yeah, I think, I, I think there's no, at least from my perspective, there's no yeah. disagreement that yeah. this is important to have some type of central analysis as long as you don't preclude you know, what might be considered more idiosyncratic the, 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 or more the, involved. The, the inviolable thing is that people can get data and analyze it. It's just the community of people who can actually do that is small. The real problem is how do we help everybody else? Because already they, you know, we, we we're going to streamline so we can get data. Yep. And, there, and there are ways to do the more heavy lifting style things. So it's possible that we would, that, that's where centralized servers, safe for variant calling, other people's data um, and mapping um, would come into play, and that would not be an app. Right. So that would but, be a big, that would you be also a introduce computer. this idea of kind of this competition that would go on among the apps, right? So if you had multiple apps that were doing the same thing, that there was a volve, right? Because there would be whatever people use the most will ultimately win out, right? Yes. This competition as opposed to some group of individuals saying this is the standard that we're going to apply. Yes. But that's, right. that's, that's yeah, more It has to be dynamic. I that's mean, what was said yesterday. Yeah. You want that. I mean, that's exactly why you want to have the apps, because you need diversity. Right. 
I think the only question is, is just in an environment where apps could potentially access data that we need to protect, you have to have some quality control or some technical mechanism in place so those apps don't just open a connection to a server and upload right. all the data. You have to have some vetting, but it, it, it could be very fine grained of like, this is scalable, you, this is not scalable, it requires special infrastructure to run. I think you just, we have to articulate what right. tools require and, and, and what that vetting, what the barrier would be for running apps, say, for free or Yeah, or so the discussion of a sandbox, right, where people would yeah. actually do that and they would, you know, lots of the kinks would be worked out. It seems yeah. like a really good one. Right? But, but, but what the opportunity here is that you can deal with data access on the level of the developer because you can control how the software, what the software accesses, so you don't deal with it on the user end. So it's not that the user, through this app, the user can't access any more what, then, what the, the app allows the user to access. But, that, but that's, I, that's the vetting question. Yeah. That, that um, on the base layer, uh, we can have the environment control which data sets and stuff a particular developer can access, but what the application spews out the other side, that's gotta be vetted if it's public. Otherwise, the application has to be run under the security framework as well. I think so this is really. With, that's what happens with, not, not security wise, but iTunes vets the applications. You can't just put one application on iTunes. Oh. Right, but there's been a lot this, of experience that iTunes doesn't do a good job of that, right? There have been multiple cases this year where Apple's had to pull apps off after users have pointed out that the app is actually inappropriate. So I don't think we can keep using Apple as this. No, no, absolutely. But, I, yeah, I think but, but, but we can in the sense that it, for the most part, it works very well. I mean, right, out of but, thousands of applications. But one from or a two security perspective, I don't know it's the best. The one thing I, I was going to say is several people mentioned clinicians using these apps. Yeah. And I think that there's a whole different clinical infrastructure for decision tools and how they have to be validated. So I'm not sure that's the best model. I would get back to David's question again about there are thousands of researchers who work on these individual genes who have very important questions that we need to make sure they can answer. And many times they see that there's a variant and they have no way of knowing right. whether that variant has any evidence of being uh, biologically important or not. David. I, this discussion really points out to me, I think, the importance that we, that we we are very active in recruiting completely unrestricted data as part of the, this exercise. If we completely ignore the category of data like George Church's PGP data, then there's nothing that's in an unrestricted environment that the app developers can work on uh, apart from this vetting process. And if we, so if we, if we don't have that, we're just gonna have this very draconian vetting process, and, and they'll be very, it'll be very difficult to encourage a creative community to get involved in this. Uh, so you, you have to have these things thoroughly developed in this free environment, because that's where the geeks work, that's where they're most active and, 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 and the most beautiful results come. And then you have to take the best of breed and go through the, an additional vetting process. But if you don't have that initial foment of activity in the open environment, you'll never get there. Lincoln. Yeah, I, I'm going to uh, add, add to what David is saying. So I think there are just, there are really two technical issues that need to be set up at the beginning. One is <clears throat> access of the apps to, uh, uh, to restricted data. I, I think that uh, it is much better, as David, as, as David said, to start out with targeting the apps at either the completely open access, either a completely open access tier or to a commons tier, such that the developers and users of the apps are certified, are certified researchers. And that removes much of the burden of detailed vetting of the detailed vetting of these apps, which I, I think everybody feels a little bit uncomfortable with the scale that we're, we're potentially talking about. The second is the issue of the, the scalability of the apps, how much resources they take up, how much storage they use, how many computes they use, and who's going to pay for that. And I, I think that 
right at the beginning we should talk about ways that the uh, the, the uh, resources used by the apps is, is born, is charged back in some way to the, to the users of the app so that there's a built-in supply, demand, and cost to the model. Otherwise, you know, it, it's, it's going to become a tragedy of the commons, that there'll be a thousand apps and none, none of them will be use, usable because they're each using too many resources. Yeah, actually, resourcing is something that we really didn't talk about, but it's a bigger discussion about how to use the cloud. Another advantage of that sort of environment is easy metering, easy find, easy way to uh, uh, meter use, pay for use, bill use, and so on. So with the cloud, NIH can just fund the analysis, fund the server, uh, and doesn't have to set up many, many parallel computing environments in different laboratories and so on. Same thing with the apps. You pay for the apps, $4.99. They use advertising also as part of their revenue, so maybe that won't be the case. So some other funds will have to pay for it. You want so I, I just want to, uh, I worry, so I, I, I know this is not being suggested, but just to make it explicit, I don't think we should put all our eggs into one app system basket. Uh, uh, nor should we put app systems on the table. So th these, these solutions are not mutually incompatible. One can have direct downloads, one can have maybe one or two different ways of cutting um, more centralized analysis. Maybe some of the big institutes in Michigan will effectively run a private in-house systems that they use just for themselves, for example. So all, all of those options should be open. And I think there's a lot of devils in the details here. For example, I.O. between your storage and, and the app thing and something else. And when we talk about apps, do we, what, what really is it? Is it a Google-like API with very restricted access to the data, or is it more like you've got our, you've got a file mount, go for it, right? And uh, so there's, there's lots and lots of details. This, this meeting is not the place to hash out those details. The, the right. place to hash out those details is in proposals to say we, we should do X, Y, and Z. But I, I want to say that there's probably, there's quite a lot of implementation risk uh, in this, and that's why one shouldn't put all one's eggs in one, in one basket for this, uh, this process. Yeah, I... Because David's point that all the data being open I, I just find it kind of remarkable how everyone seems to want to hear one thing and then object because it's not all things. Like data should be, there should be publicly available data that can be operated on, but there's a lot of data that's valuable that's not publicly available. Users who are very sophisticated should be able to get all the data so that they can innovate and be serendipitous, but the vast majority of people don't actually want to do that. They want somebody to actually provide them some answers. We should do all of the above. Apps are good, but it'll be a little complicated because we'll pay for them and vet them. Somehow, instead of seeing the diversity in these things and saying we want diversity, we're saying you do this, you won't do that. But no one's saying do one thing and not the other. Yeah, different users will be served differently with different applications. Steve, have been waiting for a long time. Yeah, so I want to put in a plea for something that hasn't been discussed yet, which is a comment on reproducible research. That the NCBI BLAST server has been one of the greatest boons for democratizing access to computational analyses of data. On the other hand, most of the result, a very large fraction of the biomedical literature belongs in the journal Irreproducible Results, in that you, know, you cannot actually get back the same result that someone did on the day they did their query. Um, you know, Heraclitus of Ephesus said that you cannot step twice into the same river because the waters are always flowing on to you. We have the problem that we can't twice query the same database because the data are flooding over us so rapidly. Um, and so we need some sort of solution so actually when someone does some sort of analysis, you can figure out what did they actually do and be able to figure out, you know, what was that actual analysis they did and be able to verify that at some later date. And I think that if we're building a platform now to enable these types of analyses to the larger biomedical community, we should be thinking about this from the get-go. So, I, you know, I, I, I agree with Steve. I want to come back to David's thing. I think that everybody is interested in everything. And I think we just need to come up with a plan that steps out what are the most important thing, what's the most important thing we could do first? Obviously, to get access. Simplified access, right? Then what's the next thing? What's the next thing? I mean, I think that everyone's interested in all aspects of everything that's on the table. It's just that some are harder to implement and will take more time. So if we could just come up, I think, at the, at the discussion time of the workshop or sometime, you know, a priority list and how difficult we think each of these steps will be 
uh, or how easy, and this is a no-brainer, we got to do this ASAP, this would be a good outcome of this workshop. I mean, I would say that, that that's definitely what, how we should move forward. But given the fact that there is a, the largest part of, uh, of biologists is underserved by data, it would seem to me that, that we shouldn't prioritize the easy things first only. So we, we, we should give weight to impact. How about yeah. cost? <laughs> I, I have a feeling that cost is going to weigh into this, and yeah, the things that cost a lot of money yeah, are but as long take as, the longest to implement. Fine, but as long as but, NIH is spending a huge amount of money generating data and a teeny amount of money to make it useful, we could question whether that's good use of no, the national No, and I, investment. I agree with you on that, David, and there are lots of ways to make it useful, but I think there are very simple ways to make the data more useful to the greater good. And I, I think this will also evolve over time, and I think trying to put forward a plan that would have everything from start to finish at this stage is kind of a fool's errand. I think what we should be thinking about is the first two or three steps that we all can agree upon as opposed to, you know, it has to go this way, this is the best plan. I mean, this will evolve, and this won't be the only meeting, I'm sure, in terms of this question. Well, and also maybe deciding, maybe there should be additional workshops that talk about certain of these things and what it would really take well, but also, to do I, some. I, I, I guess, you know, there are some clear things that we could do now, but I mean, some of us may decide that it makes sense to work on building larger scale infrastructure that will solve sort of not today's tomorrow problems, but maybe six months or a year from now. I think it, as long as we have a diversity in, of those plans forward and, and support at, at the right scales for different prototypes or projects, it seems to be a great outcome. As long as we say, you know, these are the three or four things that we definitely want to explore and have some support, and some of those can be easy and some of them can be harder. And it seems like that, that would be what we would want. We would be very enthusiastic about a specific area you know, individually, and, and, and we'd love to contribute to that, but that shouldn't preclude people from, you know, releasing data like DBGAP is talking about doing, which is also hugely valuable and can be done quickly. Yeah, so that brings up the question uh, of, of, of what to pilot, how to move forward, how much testing we do up front so we can learn for the, the, the bigger systems, and I, I know Mike wants to talk about that in the wrap-up session. <laughs>